Now he's got two of the fastest riders in this competition together in the lead group. Roberto Gaggioli, who is wearing in this race number seven, a former winner, and Davis Finney wearing, well, I guess he would hope, the lucky number 13 right now from the Coors Light team. Also in that breakaway, number 42, Brian Walton of Team Motorola. Jim Copeland, a name that we've mentioned before, he is back in there from the Subaru Montgomery team. The only member of Greg LeMond's Z team, Paul Willerton, an American, is in that breakaway group right now as well. They're approaching the wall now, and you've got Danny Fox sitting in fourth spot from the Poland Spring team. You've got Brian Walton from the, from the excuse me, Motorola team, Pastorelli and Cancenari from the G's team. That's a very dangerous combination. Pastorelli and Cancenari are two youth Italians who've done very well in the stage. Pastorelli was third in a stage, second in stages in the New Hampshire race. Cancenari won a race, was second at the race on Thursday in three holes. Both super on form riders, and this is a team that loves this bike race. They live for this bike race, even from Italy. This is a big privilege to be able to do this race. And they're making the best of it right now in the Berkeley race. Spago represented in the break by Oliver Starr. He's been very active in the closing stages of this race. And also in there, an interesting story. Number 142, Tim Rutherford, a former member of the Schwinn racing team on the road, now primarily competes in mountain bike races. So he is in there with 142. The mountain bike races are, are really strong. It's very interesting now in cycling. You have Mike Engelman, though he's not in this front group, he did very well in other races, comes into cycling from running. And mountain bike, even though it's cycling, it's a completely different sport. John Tomac on the Motorola team, one of their strong men, is from mountain biking, and it's not surprising to me to see Rutherford here. It's a, it's a lot of athletes from different sports are getting into cycling. A lot of this cross-training is coming to vogue and seeming to work. This is the moment now. We're going to see the race. Up the wall. Here they go. This is the last time on the wall, and it is official. Todd Gogolski has clinched the Subaru Power Peak competition. So no one can take that away from him, even though he has retired and is now watching the event from the cabins. This is the final climb on the wall. 139 miles are over, only 17 miles to go. They do have three short loops. On the far left is Paul Willerton. At the front of this uh, breakaway group, he is Greg LeMond's protege, a young American rider that Greg LeMond has taken to Europe to be a member of his Z team. There he is, nearest to the camera, climbing along with number 17, Jim Copeland. And in fact, Paul Willerton will be leaving the Four State U.S. Pro Championship and joining Greg LeMond for the Tour of Switzerland, which begins this weekend. Is Brian Walton? Paul Willerton is breaking this race up on the hill. He's, look at them all strung out. David Mann, the Englishman, seems to be having trouble in the back there. Roberto, you've got to realize these riders are fighting with every inch that they, of energy that they have. Riders coming off the back here. They're going to have to make it back on before the top. The RMO rider, the sprinter, seems to be coming off. Worse from Germany, yes. on the French team. He's a danger man. He's one of the few riders that can beat Davis, Spinney, and Roberto in the sprint in this group. So Paul Willerton, even though he is a member of the powerful Z team, is here by himself. So he's essentially a free agent, an outstanding climber. He was the guy forcing the pace up the hill a moment ago. Now, however, Copeland is Subaru Jim Copeland team of Subaru Montgomery. This is a man, as I said, is a national criterion champion, a short flat course specialist climbing the wall ahead of the field. The Subaru team, what a race they put on today. They've been on the attack from, from the beginning. Copeland, even though he's a criterion rider, is a strong guy, time trial rider. Eddie B, big gear, power, ergometer training, moose type of bike rider, if you will, but just really goes. Look at him tearing this race apart on the hill. Well, now we know that Todd Gogolski has clinched the Subaru power peak. It could be that Jim Copeland was getting up the hill to take those points just to make sure that no one else did. Maybe he is not sure that they have clinched that prize. So we may see, in fact, Jim Copeland. That's not a real move, but just a short-term move. There's uh, Davis Finney, number 13, at the back. He's watching Wust, the sprinter from RMO, very carefully. David Mann just ahead of Davis Finney and Marcel Wust, number 133 there for the IME Bola Wines team. Davis is in trouble. Wall. Davis is in trouble right now. He's got to get back into that group in front. Look how they're spreading out over the top of the hill here. This is where they put in the big gears and sprint over the top where it flattens up. Look at the distance. Look at how far the break is. Davis, Davis has missed a move. This is trouble for the Coors Light team right now. Well, he, trouble knows, they're in. he knows that he has that long descent, and if he can be patient, and Davis is a patient man, something that he's learned in his long career, he can still move up and rejoin. I think Marcel Wurst is also feeling much the same way, and both of them might be counting on David Mann, the Englishman that they know is very strong, to tow them back up there. So this is the back of what was 
11 or 12 riders that are the breakaway right now. They have climbed the wall the final time. There's our leader, Jim Copeland, lower left of the screen. Upper right, we see two riders moving after him. One of them would be Willerton, we saw just a moment ago. And then I believe Oliver Starr, number 34 of Spago, was close to the front at the top of the wall as well. We'll have to see at the descent how it comes up back together because a solid, solitary rider cannot go as fast down the hill as two or three or four riders coming working together. Here, there he is. Here Jim. he is pedaling. In back of Copeland are one, two, three, four, five, six riders. These six riders are going to catch Copeland most likely. If they can stay together, one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine riders, and get together, the riders off the back, including race favorite Davis Vinny, the course team, are going to be in big trouble. This is the crucial moment of the race right here. And again, we can see Copeland. that rejoining starting to happen. And here coming through the turn is Paul Willerton, and with him is number 42, Brian Walton of Motorola and the rest. Behind now comes the group that contains Davis Finney, a trio that should be coming down the hill now. Got We're Jones. just minutes away from the end of 156 grueling miles for the U.S. Pro Cycling Championship. Live coverage continues here on Channel 10. Lead rider, number 17, Jim Copeland of the Subaru Montgomery team. National Criterium champion, but as John Eustace correctly pointed out, an excellent time trialer. That means a man that is good alone against the clock. Here he's not against the clock, but rather against a whole gaggle of guys chasing him, John. Well, he's got a 10-second lead and he's holding it. One thing in his, not in his favor, because Danny Fox in front there. Danny Fox chasing Copeland, followed by Pastorelli, I believe that is. Roberto Gattoli back up in front there, but the point is Copeland, one thing, it can, has this gap. Normally, he'll be caught by these four riders. One impression I have is that this is a very, very tired breakaway. It's been an extremely fast race from the start. It's been hot. It's been, uh, it's been dry, but very hot, and they're tired, more tired than they normally be at this point in the race. It's going to be a real test of strength these last miles of this bike race. Jim Copeland. From the United States, visions of a Stars and Stripes jersey, perhaps, in his mind right now that goes to the winner of the U.S. Professional Championships, the Core States Championship here, crowns the U.S. Pro Champion. Indeed, it is uh, Jim Copeland being chased by Roberto Gaggioli. Also chasing him, number 34, Oliver Starr is back there. You mentioned Pastorelli, number 70. Nearest to the camera is Gaggioli. There's Pastorelli moving to the front, and these guys are working very, very well together. You've got Brian Walton there, the Canadian from, uh, from Motorola team. You've got Paul Willerton, Reglamont's protege and teammate. Danny Fox of Philadelphia, with almost no racing in his legs, is in front in his hometown race, riding a beautifully tactical race. Behind Danny is the Spago rider, Oliver Starr, actually a big rival of Danny's. It's a big rivalry between those two, very interesting. And Roberto back in front. The interesting news, Davis Finney off the back, David Mann off the back. And what happened to Phil Anderson? He was up in that breakaway. We lost Phil Anderson, a big blow for the Motorola team. Well, we saw Alan Piper from Australia sitting in the pits, a victim of heat, the riders that have been in Europe. It could be that Anderson has suffered the same problem. Here's Brian Walton from Canada there. Here is Gaggioli closest to the camera. And uh, this is a very, very smooth, well-oiled working group of six riders chasing Jim Copeland. And what comes to mind for with reference to Danny Fox, John, is that, well, he finished 11th and said he wanted to improve. There's only seven riders, and he's one of them. The worst he can do is 7th, and that would represent an improvement. They have, this is your leader. This is Jim Copeland on a solo attack. If I were his director, I would stop him now. I would make him wait for this group, and wait. he's throwing energy away, in my mind. I could be wrong, because so far, this team has written a brilliant, aggressive race. I think they went out there with the idea of just making it as hard as they could. Nevertheless, he's going to be caught by this group, and the winner should, uh, this group we just showed you with Gajoli and Fox, and the winner should come from this group. Jim Copeland, originally from Alabama, and earned, has earned the nickname the Alabama Slammer because one of the things that has marked his style is that he really does just get out there and plug and pound away, and sometimes, I guess, the rap on him is the tactical ability. He, sometimes he kind of forgets what might be the smart way to win a race and just tries to outmuscle everybody. It's not going to work this time. An attack, attack by Roberto Gaggioli up the side on Strawberry Mansion. He's catching, I believe he's catching Colvin already. Look at how this race is splitting apart even on this slight hill. 
These men are tired. This is going to be very hard. One thing that could happen is that they're all so tired now with the attacks going, they could become disorganized and start to lose time on the field behind. We have to get a, 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 a time check on the field. But Copeland is, is caught. It possibly, tactically, would have been better for him not to have made that move, to have saved that energy for the last five miles of the race. It was far from the finish to go on his own like that. Nevertheless, he's making the race hard. And it looks like some of the others that were struggling on the wall have also made contact. We saw the number 74 of Marcel Wuss, the German rider for the French RMO team that was right next to Danny Fox. So some of those riders, the back markers on the wall, have started to also rejoin on the long descent. And now the flats, they have plenty of time and plenty of real estate in order to patiently. There's Davis Finney. He's right back he's in back there as back. well. There's Marcel Wust and Danny Fox is now leading a group that is trying to bridge up and counter the move made by Gagioli a moment ago. Nevertheless, just to remember, so the audience gets a sense of what the fatigue levels are of these athletes. If you've been dropped on the hill, and if you have to catch back up, that catching back up means not only did you suffer on the hill and be, and be dropped, but you had to ride, instead of riding 28 miles an hour like the rest of them were riding on the flats, you have to ride 30 or 32 miles an hour to close that minute that you lost on the hill. You've been suffering from the bottom of the hill until the beginning of, of the next lap. It takes energy out of you for the end of the race, which is why you don't want to get dropped on the hill. But I still remember 1985 when big Eric Hyden got dropped on the hill, and because of the long downhill, the long flat section, he was able to recover, get into the race, and win it. So it's possible, although the caveat this year is that they have included Lemon Hill in those closing circuits. So even by the time the riders have completed climbing the wall the final time, they still have Lemon Hill to do not only one more time at the end of this large lap, but they will have it three more times during the circuits that complete the Core States Championship. We still have a long way to go in a lot of racing, but this is a very, very aggressive race. And uh, they're certainly earning every penny they get at the start line here. Now, you might be, con be concerned, or it might be interesting to tell you about the various riders and their possibilities. Each rider has his own way of winning the race. Roberto, aggressive, very fast sprinter. In Italian, they call him Svelio. It means he's awake, he's very alert, he sees everything. You have Paul Willerton here, a strong rider, endurant rider, not someone possibly that would win the overall race in the sprint. But don't forget, the first American to cross the finish line is the national champion, gets the national champion jersey. Paul Willerton can be crowned national champion, race in Europe with the Stars and Stripes jersey. That'll give him notoriety that'll last him the rest of his life. He's probably racing for that. Davis Finney, ultra-fast sprinter. He wants to stick with this group. He's on the defensive on the hills. He wants to beat them all in the sprint at the end because he's an ultra-powerful, ultra-fast rider. Brian Walton, number two rider in the group you see there. Not necessarily a sprinter. However, Brian Walton can go a uh, half a mile, one mile, two miles, three miles on his own at 35 miles an hour. He would be have physical characteristics similar to that of a miler in a, in a, in a runner. He can go very fast, or 400 meter man. He can go very fast on his own at a high cruising space. His attack to Brian Walton will be to win the race on his own. Look at how Paul Willerton here is taking control of this race. He's by himself, he has no teammates, he's charging. He's being very aggressive. It's, it's a real good ride for a young rider like this. He's ultra motivated by racing in the States here. This is one on one on one. No one has the benefit of any teammates in this lead trio. And don't forget, not far behind is still a chase going on. Here's Lemon Hill, and you can see our lead riders just a short, quick climb up Lemon Hill. And they move around the last of the real sharp corners here. They'll wow. get up to a little bit of a false flat on the top, and there behind you can see the next group, which is the rest of that 11-man group that included riders like Davis Finney, Marcel Wust, and the rest coming up behind and not far behind at that, John Eustace. They're not far behind, but the break every little bit when you are at this, at this level hurts. And they're attacking, attacking, counter-attacking. It's a very, very aggressive race. It's rare that you'll see a 156-mile race that's been fought from start to finish the way this one has. You have three riders here. Each one has his reasons for, for, uh, for working and they're going as hard as they can. Uh, you've got a very interesting tactical race going on here right now, Brian. Interesting again, and we keep bringing up Coors Light because they have Davis Finney in the second group and Roberto Gaggioli in the first group. So it's kind of one-on-one -on -one even between Davis Finney and Roberto Gaggioli. I guess Davis would like nothing better than to apply his horsepower to the chasing effort to get up to Gaggioli, but that's sort of, again, a no-no in team tactics situation. 
They just has to hope that somebody else throws him up there, and then it's out of his hands. That's true. He, he, but also, Davis Finney and Roberto are professionals. They're extremely professional riders in their mentality and their approach to the sport. Right now, Roberto, even though he's racing for himself and racing in the front and racing to victory and showing off for all his fans and friends of Philadelphia, he is setting up Davis Finney for the victory because now the gap between Roberto's group and the rest of the breakaway has to be closed by the work of some other teammate than Davis Finney. Our David, three. in essence, has a chance to rest now in case it all comes back together for the sprint. Our three riders, we have an Italian riding for an American team, Roberto Gaggioli, of course, light. Just behind him, we have a Canadian riding for an American team, number 42, Brian Walton of Motorola. And we have an American riding for a French team, number 89, Paul Willerton of Greg LeMond's Team Z. All examples of a growing internationalization of cycling. You have riders, Italian riders, who want to race in America. You have American riders who want to race in Europe. It's becoming a very complex, interesting sport. Uh, and uh, this is a good example of it today. What, how these guys are charging. Paul Willerton inheriting an opportunity here. He had no teammates to help set him up. He had to ride a strong tactical race on his own. He has put himself in a position of winning this race. As they come on to the Ben Franklin Parkway, they will loop around to Logan Circle. They will return to the finish line at the end of the final large lap in this four stage U.S. Pro Championship. Then they will have the three loops to go that include Lemon Hill. An improvement, I feel, certainly a modification to the four stage championship for 1991. Look at Roberto go. He is go he feels this way. He lives for this race, Roberto Gajol. His friends are here. He thinks and prepares and just loves this race. I can't even tell you. Look at him doing what he's doing for his fans and supporters here, putting on a show for them. These riders are going as hard as they can. They're working smoothly together. Each rider has his own reasons for working. There's absolutely nothing negative going on in this in this breakaway group, and they have a very good chance of going to the finish line. Roberto Gaggioli, a guy that responds to the cheers of the crowd. The crowd here will certainly be heard by Roberto Gaggioli. Paul Willerton. A young man that really plied his trade here in the United States without a lot of real distinction. And then by virtue simply of becoming a member of Greg LeMond's team and a protege and Greg really taking him under his wing has made a name more for himself in Europe. He'll be returning to Europe to ride the Tour of Switzerland with Greg shortly. And then Brian Walton, young man from Canada, tremendous talent, a guy that was a very, very good rider when he was a member of the 7-Eleven team. They have kept him. And he is now a member of the Transform 7-Eleven team, which is now sponsored by, team, by Motorola. Brian Wola. Brian Walton is a young rider. He does very well in time trials in Europe. Races against the watch 5, 10, 15, 20 miles. Put him on his own, he flies. He's been having some difficulty in the, not difficulty, but not up to his time trial efforts in the road races. This is one of his best ever road race efforts. And, and he's getting some words of advice from a former winner of this event, Tom Schuler, who came off with the U.S. Professional Championship win in 1987, is now the manager and is driving the team car of the Motorola team, having a word with Brian Walton. And Tom Schuler, we talk about tactical expertise, Tom Schuler in the, in the driver's seat of that Motorola team van is a guy that I think is probably from the neck up, and I've said it before, the best bike rider in the United States from the neck up. He's a smart guy, and his words to Brian Walton certainly have to be well placed at this time. Next Another down. very fast lap, the second fastest lap of the race again. They go, pro races go faster and faster and faster as the race goes on. Now the three final loops, before we just did loops around Aikens Oval here. Now what they're doing, because of new regulations, your, minute, your finishing circuit for the public has to be at least three miles long. So now, instead of just going around the Benjamin Franklin Parkway, they go back out onto the Kelly Drive and up Lemon Hill and back down. This is a brand new tactical uh, obstacle in the race. And you'll find that it um, is gonna have a big change. These riders could blow up on, on the hill. Riders could get dropped, riders could spring to the finish. We'll have to see what happens. Um, one point of interest, Paul Willerton is the only American in this breakaway group. Even if he finishes third in this race, he will be crowned national professional American champion. He has every interest in going to the front and working as hard as he possibly can, even if he gets beaten by Walton and gets Jolie for the final sprint, he can still be national champion. Alone by himself, no teammate, very little support. This would be a very good tactic of his.
Paul Willerton also, by virtue of his activity on the wall, we would have to expect, is the guy that is going to use Lemon Hill as a point of attack in these closing three loops of the race, that they are on their first of those three right now. There is Tom Schuler in the driver's seat having a word with Brian Walton. And his word has to be, don't let Willerton get rid of you in any way, shape, or form. What's quite obvious is that Tom Schuler has told Brian Walton to stop working. Look at that. Look at him leave a hole there. Mess up the breakaway. Or let them carry to the finish and attack him at the end. Because he doesn't want Brian Walton to work and work and carry Roberto Gaggioli to the finish. That's what's going on here. So, so all of a sudden, from working smoothly in the breakaway, as you saw before, Brian Walton has stopped collaborating. Now Gaggioli just sat up and very definitely stopped uh, pedaling and drifted back. There he is. He is looking down, apparently having a little bit of difficulty. Maybe he is uh, plotting his next move at this point. Roberto Gaggioli quickly rejoins, and now they are on the bottom of Lemon Hill three times. This Starting with this one, they will go up it. This is a steep little climb. Let's see what goes on. I don't think it's enough to drop anybody from this group, but it will, what it will, will take the sting out of the legs for the final sprint and possibly slow them down for the field to catch them, but the field has still some more juice in it. Now, Coors Light has a second card that they could play if this breakaway gets caught by the riders behind. But uh, Team Z, of course, Paul Willerton all by himself. And interestingly enough, if Tom Schuler has told Brian Walton to stop working, if the breakaway gets caught, and by that, if, they, if these guys start fooling around with one another and don't keep the pace up, they could easily get caught. And Motorola has no second gun to fire. No one in the chase group that is uh, there to take the opportunity if, if Walton falters. That's right. So that's exactly what Schuler is saying. Schuler is saying to Brian Walton, listen, don't work with these guys, because if you work and you get caught, you'll be tired. You might as well sit on them, have them catch you, and jump them at the end, or wait for the breakaway group to catch you, stay fresh, and jump these guys at the end also. Either way, you've got to, to either try to beat these two guys, or you have to beat this breakaway group. The only hope is to play cage. Let somebody carry you as close to the finish as possible, and then get them. That's, I do believe, the tactic they're employing here. The once it, Copeland is at the back. That effort that I told you about, that Copeland made over the wall by himself. It was strong, it was brave, Tactically, it wasn't the best effort because Copeland should be in that break now. If Copeland had saved his legs, jumped now, going up to that four-man breakaway with the power that he had, that'd be the end of the breakaway and he'd be in a position to win. Right now, he's got a hope that these three guys come back to him and they seem to be working a little bit here. There's our lead group, the chasing eight riders. These are the lead three riders, 46 seconds in between them. Far right, Roberto Gaggioli of Coors Light. A long ponytail hanging out from under his helmet. Tells us very quickly who that is. Paul Willerton is the man in the middle of the three right now as he moves to the front. Long, lean rider. Now, what made of Greg LeMond on the Z squad? Probably the best climber of these three, although climbing on short Lemon Hill really isn't, that isn't climbing per se. That's almost a little sprinter's hill. Okay, the breakaway group in the back. This is the second breakaway group behind our three leaders. Danny Fox sitting on the back. They seem to be moving pretty well there. Uh, you've got some cat and mouse. Brian Walton's working again now. I wonder, I wonder if there's been a change in the tactic. Or maybe what Brian Walton is doing is just going to the front enough to keep the thing rolling, which is sometimes a tactic you do. You work a little bit, but not too much. Maybe Gajoli said, listen, I'm going to put on the brakes and stop because I've got Davis Finney in back of me. I don't care. I'll stop and wait for him and work, wait for him to win the race. We either work a little bit or we stop the breakaway. These are the things you sometimes hear the riders or that you will, the riders will say to one another when you see them looking at each other and talking towards the end of the race. Attacked by Willerton. Attacked by Willerton. Paul Willerton has to be the aggressor on these closing loops because... If it came down to a three-man sprint, I virtually guarantee he would be third. Paul Not Willerton, the team that has been neutralized by the other two very quickly. He's putting his head down and going, Willerton. He only wants to arrive even third place because he will have beaten all the other Americans in the race. That's one of his objectives today, putting his head down and pedaling for his life. This is his chance. And even if it does come down to a sprint, you never know. He's a surprising rider. Who knew he was going to be in front like this today because his results in Europe haven't been terrific this year, but that's difficult to judge because it's, so, it's such a hard uh, circuit over there. However, Willerton, this is his best chance. He wants to stay away because he is strong. Look at him waving Brian Walton on. He's waving Brian Walton on there to work, but I don't I don't see that much collaboration there. All right? Chase group of eight riders. 
part of the original uh, 11, well, not original, the original breakaway is long since in the clubhouse at this point, but there are the eight riders chasing these three. Brian Walton to the far right, Roberto Gaggioli in the middle, Paul Willerton in the front. They are coming at the finish line after they come around Logan Circle right now. They will go down the long straightaway, cross the finish line. They will have then still two three-mile loops remaining and twice up Lemon Hill again, John. So they've done just about 150 miles, those last six, last six miles. But look look at this gap that they have. They have quite a gap still. That uh, I don't have a time gap on it, but they've got to go all the way around the oval, this group of one, two, eight riders. It's a 47-second gap to close in six miles. Here's an attack by Danny Fox from Philadelphia. Danny Fox attacking up the left there, but it doesn't look like he's going anywhere from the chase group. Well, Marcel Wust, who is the man that neutralized the attack, Danny Fox chastising the others. Wust is a sprinter. There's David Mann, the man in the red jersey there, who is uh, the fellow from Great Britain, not a sprinter. We see Oliver Starr and Jim Copeland, two members of the Subaru team, in the middle of that group. You've got one, two, three, four Subaru riders in that breakaway. Those guys, if I, unless I misread the jerseys, but at least two or three, they have got to put their heads down and go and catch this breakaway group right now. They rode an unbelievably aggressive, strong race. Tactically, they've aired at the end of this race. With that many riders in the breakaway, there's no reason the Subaru shouldn't have had a rider in, in this group in front with Roberto. The tactical error was Jim Copeland's by attacking too early. Sometimes in bike racing, quite often in bike racing. You're the fellow with the biggest heart. You want to go the hardest. You got the most courage, and that's not necessarily what you need. You have to know when to play your cards, and when you play them, play them hard. That's what somebody like Roberto Gaggioli is a genius at. There's Gaggioli of the Coors Light Silver Bullet team. Former winner could be the first man to repeat in the Core States Championship, though, John, I have to say in deference to you, the only two-time professional U.S. champion is sitting here in the broadcast booth back when the race was held in Baltimore before it became the core states. Brian Walton, the Canadian, and the only American, Paul Willerton. This is, this is quite a nail-biter because some attacks can still happen. There are two laps to go on this hill, but Roberto seems strong to me. He looks very good. He looks at ease. Walton, even though he's not working that much, is contributing a little bit to the breakaway, enough to keep it going. See him push Roberto. Mm. Push him into the break. Push him into the front. He doesn't want to work Brian Walton. Now, and the chase group is working very hard. Look at them stretched out there. There's a very good chance for this break to get caught here. Still, well, the, the race is far from over. The chase group did get caught. There's the entire field has joined the riders that were there before, including Davis Finney and David Mann and Oliver Starr and the rest. And now they have a lot more firepower to try to chase down just three riders. With two loops, that's about six miles remaining in the race. It is now virtually the entire field versus these three. Oh, this is some, some amazing race. 47 seconds, that's 20 seconds a lap. 20 seconds a lap are pretty easy, easily made up. These, Roberto better go. And Brian and and uh, Paul. Paul's going as hard as he can. He's doing a br br brilliant, beautiful ride. I, I, this is, I, I wish his European team directors could see him here from France because it would do him a lot of good in the team. He's taking command of this race. He's charging, he's attacking. It's, it's a great ride on his part. We have to see how fast the time, how fast the field behind is catching. Sometimes, though, what will happen? Will the field will be chasing? They'll see the breakaway group in back of these guys. They they'll catch that breakaway group, and the reaction from the field will be, well, we've caught the break. Let's slow down. And they won't realize possibly that these two riders are off the front. That is what these riders have got to hope for. If the field catches the first break, piece, the group behind these riders, the number two group becomes one huge group and stalls and sort of doesn't becomes confused about what to do. They're dancing up Lemon Hill. They'll have to do that one more time. And here are the main group that is chasing them is just entering the road at the bottom of Lemon Hill. So indeed, there is not very much distance between the chase group and it is Subaru Montgomery that is making that chase at the front of the main field right now. Body English, body language tells us a lot, and we didn't see a real determined effort out of those three breakaway riders the last time going up the hill. I would have thought to see an attack by Willerton on Lemon Hill. He might have to get rid of these two guys because they're not helping him very much, and Brian Walton is not helping him at all. No. Brian, I think this is a short hill. I think these fellows' goose is cooked, as you might say. They're going to get caught pretty soon, especially with the Subaru riders making the train in the back. 
in that case, it looks like the tactic of Tom Schuler in telling Brian Walton just to sit on hope for the best might indeed turn out to be a good one because Motorola would then still have its man Phil Anderson back there, and his gun has yet to be fired, at least in earnest, to the finish. That's true. Phil Anderson could win a sprint. Although Phil isn't your ultra-fast criterium sprinter, he's real fast, ultra-fast criterium sprinter, these men are sprinting after 156 miles. What wins a sprint after 156 miles? Power, endurance, and savvy. Phil Anderson has all three of those. You have Davis Finney also sitting pretty. Roberto's setting him up for that. Davis is sitting on the wheels. The Subaru riders are chasing behind Roberto and using themselves up. Do the Subaru riders have a super sprinter like that? I'm not quite sure. I don't think so. Well, Mirzewski is no slouch in a sprint. They have a lot of strong, powerful riders, and if indeed that is what it takes to win at the end of a 156-mile race, they have the ability to do just exactly that. We have to tell you very quickly, the fourth and unseen and unheard member of our broadcast booth here is our statistician Rich Carlson, the editor of Winning Magazine, who has said that Brian Walton has been troubled by asthma earlier this season, so that could be a very objective reason why he has not been able to help very much in this breakaway, added to the fact that he was virtually told not to do so, or maybe it was Tom Schuler asking him if he, how he felt in the break before. The gap is down to 22 seconds. Walton is going as hard as he can, doing the race of his life. I don't think that they're going to stay away. You never know. The field might stop. But generally, it's almost like a feeding frenzy. A lot of looking around by Roberto Gaggioli. And when you see those guys wearing their heads on a swivel like that, you know that they are concerned about the gap behind them. 22 seconds behind them, to be exact. Now Gaggioli with a renewed effort. This is the hyperactive one. Roberto Gaggioli, who was stalling a little bit before, and now he has mounted quickly with an attack, approaching the finish line with one lap to go. The field is going to catch them, Brian. They're being pulled amazingly hard by, by the Polish rider, Mirzajewski, and I think they're going to catch them soon. What Roberto's doing here is putting on a fantastic performance for his public here in Philadelphia, and everybody better realize he's trying his guts out here. You've got Kurt Stockton in the race. Let's, he's a small team rider, last year's third place finisher, national professional champion. Everyone's discounted Kurt. Small team, haven't heard that much about him. Kurt, Kurt Stockton could win this sprint. Small rider, but a small team, small backing, but he's very strong. A lot of sprinters coming up to the front here. So Roberto Gaggioli not content to lay down and get caught. Willerton has also put his effort into it. Perhaps the move was to shed Brian Walton. They are signaling uh, now perhaps even to the motorcycle camera to get around them. They want uh, the draft of the, of the motorbike, which of course is not going to happen. Brian, Brian Walton has done that attack that we talked about. There he goes on his own. He oh. sat on Gaggioli. He waited, Gaggioli and Willerton. He waited. Now he's making his bid for victory. Brian Walton is a time trial specialist. His forte is riding very fast by himself. That's what he's doing here. This is his best hope. Look at the field behind all spread out. It's like a feeding frenzy. The sharks looking at him going from one side of the road to the other. This is Motorola's chance. So the rested Brian Walton countered off the move of Roberto Gaggioli that you could just sense the feeding frenzy of the main class behind. And it is Brian Walton. Approaching the line with one lap to go, three miles remaining in this event. Brian Walton, the Canadian rider for the American Motorola team, he has just three miles, including one last climb up Lemon Hill, remaining in this race. What a finish this is going to be. The field's coming up. What's going on right now is the Motorola riders are swarming at the front of this field to slow it down. They're doing everything they can to make sure the chase doesn't go on. And, and what they are doing, the field is spread out all over the road, which means that something's going on and they're not being caught. They're not working together the field. When they're all in a bunch spread out, there's confusion, there's hesitation. When they're all in a single line, there's commitment and they're going fast. This is Walton making a bid for victory. Nothing but the back of the saddle showing this is a man that is in the biggest gear he can possibly muscle, and he has given it everything he's got. He pushes himself back onto the saddle, and because of the effort in his legs, he starts to crawl forward again. Brian Walton in full cry time trial mode, heading outbound on Kelly Drive towards the Lemon Hill climb. Then he'll return to the Ben Franklin Parkway. If he can get around Logan Sirtle and head for home, he will be the winner of the Four States U.S. Pro Championship. And then it will only be remaining to see who the first American is to take the Stars and Stripes jersey as the U.S. professional champion. 
What a ride he's doing, Brian Walton. He's in full cry here, flying as hard as he can. Be a specialist with a sort of effort. He could, he, he can maintain the gap. If the Motorola riders can shut the field down, let's see the gap. The gap's enough for him to win. The gap is enough for him to win, Brian Walton. What a coach Tom Schuler is. Indeed, what a tactician. Indeed he is. Tom Schuler, when he's riding the bike himself, is a thinking man's bike rider, and now sitting behind the wheel of the Motorola team van has planned out a beautiful tactical final lap for Brian Walton, and it's up to the young Canadian to deliver. No one has ever won this race by themselves. They've always been sprints from one or two or even bigger groups. To win a race by yourself is the ultimate. You want to win a race alone. That's the most prestigious way. You left everybody behind, and you won the race. This is what Brian's trying to do here. Oh, what a beautiful race this is. Brian Walton soloing away. Could be making history here in Philadelphia. If indeed he can hold on for the solo win, but at only eight, maybe 10 seconds lead, he has to rely not only on the strength of his own legs, but on the very intense, disruptive activity of his teammates from Motorola back there in the bunch. There's and the now, look at this. The gap is virtually nothing. And it looks as though Brian Walton's effort is going to go for naught as the Coors Light team, led by Alexi Graywall, attacking the hill with a vengeance. All right, Alexi Graywall is closing the gap. This is Alexi's do-or-die effort here. He's closing the gap to set up Davis Finney for the sprint. Right now, the Coors tactic is to set their star rider up, Davis Finney, to win this, this bunch sprint. Davis's specialty. Motorola has got Brian Walton in front, forcing the other riders to, to use efforts, and they've not just now caught Brian Walton. What a race he did, though, Brian. Oh, man. 154 and a half miles was how long Brian Walton wished this race might be, because with about a mile and a half, maybe two to go, it is an altogether new race, and it is in the hands now of the sprinters, of the riders who have the turn of speed, or as John said more accurately, the strength to be able to continue to push those pedals over after 156 miles of racing. Attacked by Roy Nick. This is the feeding frenzy I was telling you about. One after another after another. The riders are going to try to go away by themselves because they want to avoid the sprint. Look, the field is split on Lemon Hill. The, fit, the field has split on Lemon Hill. What you talked about, you have in front there, Frankie Andreu. Frankie Andreu, a very fast rider, Kanzanieri. another guy highly motivated. There's Canzanieri, the man that was fourth in this race last year, knows how to get to the finish line in a hurry. It was his teammate, Cimini, that came out with the victory, but this man, Canzanieri, certainly contributed to that effort. That might be Norm Alvis. I might have misidentified the rider. That might be Norm Alvis. And there I believe... goes number 73. That's Richard Varank again of RMO being controlled by Coors Light rider. That's Chris Huber of Coors Light, I believe, number nine, that's countered the move quickly, and this is just getting crazy now. They are on the Ben Franklin Parkway, or very close to it. As they round the museum turn, they will be on the Ben Franklin Parkway. They have then only to get down to Logan Circle and back to the finish for the first time in the history of the core states u.s pro championship john we are going to see not a sprint of three or four or five six seven riders or last year 11 but this year it looks like it's going to be a massive bunch finish there are a half lap to go right now a one half short lap around the ben franklin parkway greg orovitz the big powerful motor of course light is the man that's leading it right now uh, and on the back of greg orovitz is the russian Shamil. t-c-h-m-i-l-e Shamil. it means bumblebee he's been sitting in the race as long as he can he was Russian amateur national champion. Oh, the race is splitting and attacking all over the place here. All the strong men who could possibly have anything left are going to the front now. And another attack. Attack off to the left, the right side of the field. The little groups attack, they move, they try to hook up, and they're hoping they can avoid this bunch sprint. Now we but see the snake, John, as it's sinuous movement back and forth across the road. The riders attack, they sit up, they, they move from one side to the other, trying to shake someone off their wheel. Greg Oravet, soft pedaling along at the front, knowing that everyone, and I mean everyone, is coming up behind. Who will make the next move? They look to be setting. Coors Light is working for, for Davis Finney. You see Motorola up there, still very prominent in the action. We have riders. This is going to be a total mess. We also, I believe, see number 46 of Dan Fox sitting in second spot there on the left of the screen. That's Matt Eaton. I'm sorry. Matt Eaton. There we go. The rocking style of Matt Eaton from Renfrew, Pennsylvania. All over the place here. But the victory is not going to come from that front two or three riders. It's going to be from a ways back that the winning sprint is made. They're in the final straightaway. 
If you've never seen a field sprint, this is one of the wildest things in sport. You called it, Brian. Coming down that final straightaway, everyone and anyone has a chance at this. Will it be the familiar two-arm salute of Davis Finney? This is his arena. Will it be the big man, Mike Zanoli? We don't see him firmly. Yes, there he is. Big Mike Zanoli coming right out of the middle, powering his way to the finish line. Look at this. The big Dutchman will do the virtually impossible. And it looks like right next to him was Davis Finney. So Davis Finney unofficially the United States professional champion. But the victory goes to the big man, the Zan man, they call him. Six foot six, 200 pounds of Michael Zanoli, former Coors Light teammate of Davis Finney, now a member of the Tulip team, getting the win here at the Coors State U.S. Pro Championship. All right, we'll be back with the winners in just a moment.